What happens when charges flow through an electric field and a magnetic field at the same time? And what happens if both those fields exert forces on the moving charge, which they will? Well, we can use knowledge about the strengths of both of these charges to find out more about the little charge that moves through it. For example, its mass or its charge or its velocity. And so a good example of this would be using deflection tubes. But before we start, uh, this is a continuation of my previous video, which is when a charge moves through a magnetic field, so you can go check out that one first. So this is a deflection tube, and you might know this already. It's essentially a vacuum tube where there's nothing, no, there's vacuum in it, and then there is an electron gun here which produces an electron beam. We use an electron field here using these, electric field here using these plates in order to influence the path of the electron beam Electrons are negative, so you can see that this one is deflected upwards because there's a positive plate here. Now that's very obvious. What we can do is, we can actually try to make this beam travel in a straight line, no deflection at all. And the way that we have to do this is, because there is a force upwards on the electron beam provided by the electric field, let's say electric field strength is E, then the force would be E times E, which is the charge of one electron. So that's the force. We need to create a force that is directly opposite, but equal in magnitude to this force. We're going to do that using a magnetic field. So to allow the electron beam to be horizontal, the electron force, the electric force must equal the magnetic force. We use Heinholtz coils to make the magnetic force and the way that these are is that they're basically just coils you know they're all around this thing and what they do is because there's current in it there's going to be a magnetic field that's formed something like this so you have this magnetic field and in the middle of the coil you get a more or less uniform magnetic field and this is the sort of thing that we will use this uniform magnetic field put it on this so what happens is you can get your left hand out and use the Fleming's left hand rule. This is the left hand rule. We have the force, we have the direction of the magnetic field, and then we have conventional current. So since this is an electron beam, we say that con conventional current is flowing in the opposite direction. So that's that. And then we have the force that's required to be down there. So if you point your left hand correctly, you should get that the magnetic field should be going directly into the screen. So if you can, you know, somehow move these Heimholtz coils, move them here, make sure that their magnetic field that goes like this actually goes into the screen, you will be able to provide a force downwards. And so when there is no deflection and it just travels in a horizontal line, which, that means that the magnetic force on the beam directly equals the electron force, the electric force on the beam. So EE would equal BEV. Um, and this is the force of the magnetic field. This is the force of an electric field. We can cancel out E and we will get V, which is the speed, equals the ratio of the electric field to the magnetic flux density, which is very cool. Now we know that the electric field is voltage over distance between the plates, and this is the voltage, this is the distance between the plates, so we can also get the equation. The V, which stands for velocity, is the V, which stands for difference in voltage, over BD. So that's the general idea. And using this idea, we can do something called velocity selection. Now, velocity selection is used in devices such as mass spectrometers, etc., where it is desired to produce a beam of charged particles all with the same velocity. You might remember from the previous video that in things like bubble chambers, you put a certain charge or maybe different charges into the bubble chamber. For instance, if this is a negative charge, it goes in, it's going to get a small spiral to this side put in the positive charge with the same speed, it will get a much bigger spiral to this side because the mass is bigger. But the prerequisite for this is that their velocity has to be the same in order to get the correct ratio of the radiuses, right? So even for things like these um, hydrogen tanks, these bubble chambers, it is desired to make certain particles have the exact same velocity, but these particles are very small. So getting them to have the same velocity is really difficult usually. The only way that we can influence their velocity 
is by using electric or magnetic fields. We can't like push them with our hand in order to give them the same velocity because they're way too small. So this is the sort of thing that we use to make them have the same velocity. The name suggests that you select the velocity with that, that, that you desire, and that's exactly what it is. What we have here is we have two parallel plates in an evacuated chamber, that just means it's a vacuum chamber, and this provides a uniform electric field, E. So you see that this is positive and this is negative, so you have the electric field, E, and this is a negative charge, it's a negative Q, it's traveling through it. What happens is, because this is negative, it's going to gain a force upwards, attracted to this. And the force will be F equals to EQ. Now, what we're then going to say is that the region between the plates has also a magnetic field of flux density B, and the charged particles, which are going to be electrons or ions, are going to enter from the left. So they all enter from here, and they have different types of velocities, but they all have the same charge and the mass. Now, the, the force of the electric field will be the same for all particles since they have the same charge. Remember, it's, if it's electrons, they're going to be all electrons. If it's a certain type of ion, it's going to be the, all the same type of ion. So EE will be the same for everything. But the magnetic force, BEV, will be greater, and that's according to the value of the velocity. What's very special about the magnetic force is that it depends on the speed of the moving charge. And therefore, only so what we're trying to do is if your charge it has a force upwards, if because of the magnetic field it also has a force downwards, if both of those are equally the same, then the resultant force is zero. Only those will be completely undeflected and only those will make their way through this puncture. If it's if it's it's traveling way too slowly, then the magnetic field force, which is BEV, will be way too small. So it will actually be deflected more upwards. What if V is way too fast? Then the force of the magnetic field will be much too big. It will be deflected slightly downwards. They will not make it out of this chamber. Only those that have the exact same EE equals BEV are going to be undeflected. And make it out. So that's the general idea. And then we see that hence for particles traveling at the desired speed, E and B V will balance and they will emerge undeflected. So we do not also need to be concerned with weight, right? Because this will be much smaller than the electric and magnetic forces. It is true that, you know, if this is conducted on Earth, there is going to be a force weighing it down, and that's the gravitational force. G times mass, which is going to be weight. But we don't need to care about this because this is way too small for the charge. It's, it's a very, very infinitesimally small mass, so we don't have to care about this because the force of the magnetic and electric forces on it will be much greater. So this clearly tells us that by changing the electric field strength, the E, as well as changing the magnetic field uh, flux density, the B, we can adjust these things to get the desired V of the resultant ions. And they will also co coincidentally all have the exact same velocity. So that's the sort of theory behind velocity selection. So now let's extrapolate on this idea of interacting between magnetic and electric fields. We have the Hall effect. Now the Hall probe is made of a semiconductor. And this is used because electrons move much faster um, for a given current. And this is what the Hall probe is. Now, with the Hall effect, we can actually get information about the mass of the electron, the speed of the electron, the current, um, and also obviously the electric and magnetic fields. So what happens is, imagine this Hall probe. This is a piece of a semiconductor. It's like a flat sort of surface, it's a flat sheet of semiconductor, it has very little electrons in it, the number density of electrons is very small, and therefore for a given current the electrons move very very quickly. Now, because they move very quickly, the magnetic force on them will be very high because V is going to increase a lot, so that's why semiconductors are used. What happens is, we decide to 
have a small current that flows through the semiconductor and that's what we see here so initially initially what we're going to have is we're going to have a semiconductor like that and then we're going to have a current that's flowing through it like this through it so it's a metal and then we have to do we have to exert a magnetic field we have to apply it into the conductor so we apply the magnetic field into it like that Th right through it and this is going to be 90 degrees perpendicular to the surface of the semiconductor if you can imagine that what happens then is that the electrons are going to be pushed sideways by the magnetic force and you can use this you can use your lemmings left hand rule to um, try and determine which direction the force is going to be the conventional current is actually going to be down but that means the electron flow is going to be upwards. So yeah, just look at the conventional current and then you can take a look at what exactly would happen. I am getting that the electrons will be pushed to the side. This is the direction of the force. So what happens is that these electrons are going to start to be pushed to the side. They're going to accumulate on one side of this probe or this like flat sheet of semiconductor. That's what you're seeing right here. Remember that this is conventional current, but I also drew the opposite direction that's showing you that that's electron flow. As this field is exerted, the electrons are going to be pushed to one side. More and more electrons are going to accumulate on one side of the semiconductor. Now, this difference in charge, so there's going to be more electrons here, less electrons here. This difference is going to be detected as a small voltage across the probe. So if you hook up a voltmeter to this, you're going to get a certain value. Now, this means that we can keep on adding the magnetic field, and what's going to happen is the electrons are going to keep getting pushed to one side until the electrons have accumulated so much on this side that they start repelling each other, because like charges are going to repel. Eventually, the repulsive force between the electrons are going to be equal to the magnetic force on the electrons pushing them there, and they're not going to move anymore. So there is a certain maximum voltage that you're going to reach. And I hope that makes sense. So when you reach this maximum voltage, we call it the Hall voltage. And the Hall voltage is denoted by V with a small h. And that's the Hall voltage. That's the maximum voltage you're going to get if you did it experimentally. So the Hall voltage is the voltage which appears between the two opposite sides of the slice at a maximum. Now, we see that the... D is the width of the slice, and we obviously have the fact that the electric field is basically the voltage divided by the distance between the two parts. So we've learned this very long time ago in a video about electric fields. So using this, we have found this equation. Now, an electron through the sli slice would experience a force to the right by the force BEV. It will experience a force to the right side. Um, it will also experience a force E, E, to the left. This is the electric field force provided by the whole voltage, which means that force will push the electrons over here. And as I said, eventually they will balance. So when the current first starts to flow, there is no Hall voltage, and hence the electron is pushed to the right by the magnetic force. But as the charge on the right builds up, so does the electric field. This pushes the electron to the left. Soon, an equilibrium is reached, which is the maximum voltage. The resultant force on the next electron is zero because they equal each other in this way. The force equals the force. And so we know that E equals the Hall voltage over the distance, so we can substitute that in there. We also know something interesting, which is this equation. So what we're talking about in V is the velocity of one electron, right, in the current. This is also somewhat because this is an actual current. This is not just one charge flowing through the um, Hall probe. This is a whole current. And so this electron does not move with one voltage. It actually moves with a mean velocity of all of the current, uh, all of the charges in the current. And uh, hopefully you can remember that the mean velocity is basically, even though individual charges move very quickly, they keep colliding with other charges, maybe they collide here and there and here and there. So like, even though they travel really quickly in terms of like these individual paths, overall they travel very slowly. And that is essentially the speed of a charge 
in a current. So now we can't just look at the individual speed anymore because that's not representative of how fast an electron travels here. We have to look at the mean velocity. And so the, the, the equation for the mean velocity is I equals NAVE. And this is a capital A. And what we're going to get is that's an equation that has the number density of the electrons. That's the area, cross-sectional area, the mean velocity, as well as the charge of the electrons. So we get the mean velocity is this. We put this and we substitute it into here. And that's what you can see right here. So we can rearrange it and we can eventually get the equation. The Hall voltage is magnetic flux density times the current times the um, distance or maybe the width of the Hall volt, uh, the Hall probe. And we have number density, the cross-sectional area, as well as the charge of an electron. So provided because this is an electron flowing through the Hall probe. Now the area of the cross-sectional area of a conductor is obviously A is D over T. So, you know, let's say we have that sort of like width and thickness. This would be thickness. This would be the width. That would be A. And because, you know, this is also D, right? The distance between the two plates, I guess you could say, that causes the electric field is also D. We can actually cancel the D out and we will get a final equation of the Hall voltage is this equation. So that's about it for Hall voltage. If you eventually reach an equilibrium, you will, and if you do the experiment, you will realize that the voltage doesn't change anymore. That's when this voltage can be used to get all sorts of information. If you know the current, um, and you probably know the, you know, the electron charge, and if you have some information about the metal itself, you also know the number density. You can also measure the thickness then you will get, be able to find out what magnitude of magnetic field did I actually apply into the Hall probe. So that's basically how it works. And you know, a Hall probe is used to calculate a magnetic field. Well, that's how they do it, because you have enough information about the voltage, the current, and also about the um, Hall probe, the piece of metal in and of itself. So that's how that works, and it makes... It, makes usage of this property of a charge flowing through a magnetic and an electric field. So that's about it for this video. I hope it was helpful. And for similar videos about A2 physics, do check out the other videos on my channel. Thank you for watching.